Hello, my name is Dr. Andrew Sanderson, and I earned my Master of Public Health in Health Policy and Management with the class of 2016. I'm also a current member of the Harvard Chan School Alumni Association and the Chief Medical Officer for the Water Environment Federation, which is located in Alexandria, Virginia. WEF is a not-for-profit technological and educational association, which is, has a primary focus of protecting the health and safety of water treatment professionals, both in the United States and globally. That's why I'm so excited about today's program, which will showcase the work of Harvard Chan alumna Noor Sharara, MPH class of 2015, in her role as public health scientist at BioBot Analytics, as well as the crucial role wastewater epidemiology plays to track disease infection trends such as COVID-19. The Office for Alumni Affairs at the Chan School is always looking to support programming that highlights the important work of our alumni and faculty. So we're happy to help bring this program to you today. Nor will give her presentation and then we'll have some time for audience questions. So please use the Q&A box to submit your questions. Nor. Thank you. Um, thank you for having me today. Thank you, Andrew, for the introduction. I'm really happy to be back at the School of Public Health. I wish this was in person, but hopefully this will be uh, for uh, a later time. So before delving into wastewater epidemiology uh, and um, you know, how it's been used since the start of the pandemic on, on COVID-19 and beyond, I thought uh, I'd, step, I'd take a step back and think about what did I think about sewage when I was getting my uh, public health training. Uh, next, please. Um, so when I was getting my MPH, I remembered sewage as a vector of transmission. We knew that um, ingesting or bathing in untreated or contaminated or stagnating waters would lead to diseases. And you're all very familiar with the Broad Street um, pump map when uh, John Snow, father of uh, modern day epidemiology uh, investigated the source of a cholera epidemic and his investigation led um, to the conclusion that contaminated water from the Broad Street pump was the source of the disease and that the removal of the handle uh, would end uh, the epidemic. And so this is what I thought about sewage um, when I was uh, getting my, my MPH. Uh, next, please. And then the pandemic happened. Um, and then when the pandemic started, I launched a wastewater analytics company uh, called Biobot Analytics. Um, and Biobot was launched in 2017. Uh, it's a spin out of MIT where both of our co-founders, uh, Dr. Mariana Matus and Nusha Gailey met during uh, their studies and work. And at the time um, they were investigating the, the they were addressing the opioid epidemic, which was the public health um, crisis uh, at, at the time. And so in 2017, what they were doing is that they were collecting samples from manhole level. So at the neighborhood level, when we walk on the street and analyzing in there how much opioids uh, was being uh, consumed. And that allowed to do some um, heat mapping within a city to try and see areas of high consumption and, and exposure to opioids versus lower um, uh, lower consumption of, of opioids. And this data set was extremely helpful for city officials and public health professionals working on uh, substance use uh, uh, disorder programs. Next, please. And then in 2020, when uh, the pandemic started, um, Biobot very quickly pivoted from opioids to SARS-CoV-2 and working with scientists at the Harvard TH Chan School of Public Health and MIT developed very quickly an assay um, to detect SARS-CoV-2 in wastewater in the greater Boston area and measure it. Next, please. Um, and so why do we look for SARS-CoV-2 in wastewater? So the SARS-CoV-2 virus is shed in the stool of infected patients. And, and that includes all infected patients, asymptomatic, pre-symptomatic, pre symptomatic. And what was neat is that as the pandemic unfolded, uh, vaccination status did not alter that, that ability. Vaccinated individuals who had breakthrough infections would still show up um, in um, a wastewater um, 
analysis uh, result. And so because the virus is shed in the stool of uh, infected uh, patients, flushed down the toilet, goes into the sewage, all the way to the wastewater treatment plant, when we received the sample that was taken at the wastewater treatment plant, we're able to uh, measure the virus um, RNA that is found and give out a result uh, in uh, genomic uh, copies per liter of, of sewage. Next, please. Um, and so why sample from wastewater treatment plants? Since the start of the pandemic, uh, we have been working with wastewater treatment plants across the country, but not just us. I mean, wastewater epidemiology has taken off in the US and everywhere else uh, in, in the world, uh, pretty much. And um, be it state labs or university labs or other groups um, that, that are part of our ecosystem work with samples from uh, wastewater treatment plants. And so data that is generated from sewage is a complete look of infections in a given uh, geographical area. So a wastewater treatment plant will receive water from a given geographical area. And the data that we are able to extract from our analysis of, of that sample really gives a readout of everyone that is um, in that community and using the toilet. And so nothing short of individually testing everyone in the area would yield the same amount of information. Um, and so that data set can be used to independently uh, evaluate COVID-19 burden uh, and trends in, in a community, so across time and space. Uh, but also, as you can see on the map, rank areas of high versus low um, transmission and based on the amount of SARS-CoV-2 that is found. And so just like that, with one sort of sample analyzed, we're able to get a community risk uh, indicator um, in time and space. Next, please. Uh, and so what are the key advantages of this, of this data set? So now that we're two years in almost of um, analyzing sewage from um, you know, locations ac across the, the country, um, the first advantage of this data set is that it's very comprehensive. Everyone that is infected, that uses a toilet that is connected to a sewage system will show up in um, a wastewater sample uh, analysis. And so that includes asymptomatic cases, uh, which would not be captured by clinical uh, case data. It also addresses a huge uh, problem of bar barriers to testing as we know. And barriers to testing comes in different flavors. First of all, there's limited availability of testing. We have seen this at the start of the pandemic and we saw it again during the Omicron surge where um, there was just, it was very hard to get a test. It was even harder to get results very quickly. Sometimes it would take five to a week, five to seven days before people would get results. Um, then there's geographical areas that are just not uh, near um, testing centers. So think about sort of medical deserts. Then there's individuals who don't have access to the healthcare system, have very limited access uh, to testing. Then there's people who are hesitant to get tested. There's fear of stigma. There's also fear of getting a positive result and not being able um, to work and potentially put one's livelihood uh, at risk. Uh, and then most recently, uh, now that at home and sort of rapid antigen tests have become much more available, widely available in the US. There's also all those tests that people take that are not captured in um, official statistics. And so for all these reasons, uh, wastewater uh, data really acts as a great complementary because it addresses all the limitations that come with um, relying only on clinical case data. Um, another key advantage of this, uh, of this data set is that it's inclusive. We, we always say that everyone has a voice uh, in, in the sewer, uh, including people who don't have access to the healthcare system. Um, wastewater sampling is simple. One wastewater sample will give information on a whole community. It's very fast. Um, we are able to get Give, give, give back results within 24 hours. And even when you know, we were at the peak of the Delta curve and the peak of the Omicron curve, um, we did not face the issues that clinical uh, testing faced in terms of much slower turnaround time um, uh, to, to send back results. Uh, and last but not least, uh, wastewater has proven more than once in, in, in this pandemic to be a leading indicator. 
And that's for two main reasons. The first one is a biological one. Um, infected individuals shed the virus in their stool very early on in their infection cycle. So before even they potentially become symptomatic and then go get a test and then wait for a result and then aggregated um, clinical data uh, results are reported at the county or state level. So all this time frame, wastewater doesn't it is completely in, independent of all these uh, variables and very quickly can um, give out uh, uh, information. And so, you know, the mix of the health system limitations of access and turnaround time and the biological fact that there is a hyper shedding period at, at the beginning of the infection course um, have rendered uh, wastewater uh, data to be a leading indicator uh, by four to six days, but really we saw 10 days at some point when uh, the, the, testing is, the, the testing infrastructure was um, really suboptimal in, at some point. And so taking all this into account, uh, two years into this, we can really say that wastewater data may be the best way to measure uh, COVID-19 disease activity uh, in real time. So taking this aggregate sort of bird's eye view of what's happening in a given community. Um, it has proven to be very reliable uh, by both public health officials, decision makers um, uh, across the board. Next, please. Um, so some of you in the Boston area may be uh, familiar with this, the, the data set and this trend line that you know, the, the media has picked up both in the Boston area, but really uh, across the country. We've had a wonderful partnership since the start of the pandemic, working with MWRA, the Massachusetts Water Resource Authority. And we've been able to, you know, have historical data, as you, as you can see from, from these trend lines. And um, it's really come to be uh, the go-to source to see um, trends and where is the pandemic heading. And, and that's really when wastewater data becomes very important to detect uh, inflection points. And for instance, if we look at last year, so beginning January 2021, vaccination was just getting started. The British variant was just starting to infect more people. It was more transmissible. And we clearly detected this increase. And you can see that the steep of, of, of the line um, in, in that trend was much um, steeper than even what we had uh, back in you know, the spring of 2020 when we're getting started uh, with, with the pandemic. You can also see it, of course, much more uh, clearly uh, when the Omicron surge started uh, after Thanksgiving and sort of how um, steep that was. Um, what you can also see is the leading indicator that I was just referring to. The dark green is wastewater data, the light green is clinical data, and if you look it's very clear um, during the Omicron surge that the wastewater incline uh, precedes the clinical case um, incline by uh, a, a few weeks. But more than just situational awareness, which is you know, what meets the eye when you look at this, uh, what this data set has, has proven to be very useful for, so yes, detection in, in trends and inflection points in the, in the pandemic for instance, when Omicron peaked, um, you know, we could breathe a sigh of relief that, okay, we can see the wastewater starting to dip. And in the Boston area, um, many newspapers saying, okay, looks like, you know, we, we see the light at the, at the end of, of the tunnel. Um, but more than just that, this data set has been very useful to plan, to plan for testing, for instance, as soon as an increase in wastewater shows up, we know that that means that there's higher community transmission. And we know the reproductive number of this virus. We know that it's exponential spread. So there's a lot of things that there's a, that we can put in, um, in motion once we see um, uh, a trend change in, um, in, in wastewater. There is planning. Uh, we, we've also worked with hospital systems that look very carefully at, at this data to think about nursing staff think about beds, think also about monoclonal antibodies that may not work for one variant versus another one. It's, and, and that was definitely the case during the Omicron surge when the wastewater started its incline uh, very rapidly. And we knew that some drugs were not as effective against Omicron than Delta, for instance, then it's a lot of sort of clinical um, uh, decisions that need to be uh, made. And you know all this preparation that hospitals 
need to do, as we know that this is a leading indicator and that after cases come hospitalizations uh, and, uh, and more. Uh, and so it's very much this sort of double, uh, double use, you know, there's the people like, you know, individual citizens like me who can look at this to, to, to guess what's my community risk right now. If I go out, is there a lot? Is there less? Are we? And then there's decision makers who use this data to uh, take decisions for hospitals, for instance, or for their constituents. Um, there was the chief medical officer of the Boston Children's Hospital uh, who was interviewed in the New York Times and said that once Omicron peaked in wastewater and really started its descent, um, that was a way for them to start thinking about rescheduling uh, elective surgeries that had been canceled due to the Omicron surge. So there's various ways in which um, this data set, of course, used in conjunction with the other data sets that we monitor, like case data and hospitalization and death, uh, can be very informative um, as we respond in real time uh, to an evolving and very dynamic pandemic. Next, please. Um, and so I've spoken a fair bit about the Boston area, but uh, as I said, we work uh, across the US. And in fact, in last summer in 2021, we partnered with the US Department of Health and Human Services and the CDC um, to launch a nationwide uh, wastewater monitoring program. So the CDC, uh, about six months into the pandemic, launched the National Wastewater Surveillance System. And as part of this uh, wastewater um, surveillance system, they partnered with us last summer to uh, enroll wastewater treatment plants from across the US, all 50 states, tribal territories. And you know, we, we had a, a coverage of over 90 million um, Americans through this, uh, through this partnership. And more than just measuring how much SARS-CoV-2 was in, in wastewater, what we also did uh, in partnership um, with Concentric uh, by Ginkgo was doing genomic sequencing on wastewater samples. Um, and that's something that has really uh, emerged as well as a key strength of wastewater epidemiology is the way it can complement um, genomic sequencing done on clinical uh, samples. Next, please. And so what we saw during the summer, and if you remember before the Omicron variant, there was a Delta variant, and we really saw the Delta variant sort of sweep through um, the US uh, last summer. So, you know, on the top is wastewater data, on the bottom is clinical cases, and you can really see how, you know, it, as the summer progressed and the Delta variant took over, um, cases, um, cases increased. Next, please. Um, and that's uh, data uh, specific to, to genomic sequencing. You can really see that, you know, in July, how uh, Delta completely took over um, um, the alpha variant to come to, you know, be over 90% of, um, of the variant found in, um, in wastewater sample. Uh, next, please. Um, and so, yeah, on this, on this point of genomic sequencing, one other thing I wanted to add is that in the latest Omicron surge, in fact, um, genomic sequencing done on wastewater samples found the presence of Omicron in a, in, in a community before clinical specimen had been sequenced and reported uh, Omicron as well. And so that is definitely something, uh, a, a key strength of wastewater epidemiology that has to continue as we enter this, you know, new wave and new phase uh, of, of, of the pandemic. And it can be to detect uh, a new variant, it can be to detect resurgence of disease, um, but it, it's definitely something that has to be part of our arsenal as we think about how do we live and continue uh, to do public health surveillance, uh, in this uh, next phase of the pandemic. Next, please. Um, and I, I had promised uh, Andrew that I wouldn't only speak about uh, COVID-19 uh, because wastewater epi epidemiology can be useful for all kinds of other pathogens. We really feel like we just started and we're just scratching the surface here. Um, we at Biobot started uh, already doing uh, pilots to monitor influenza in, in wastewater and you know, um, other, other groups in, in the US are also doing that. Um, 
there is uh, a lot of interest in tracking antibiotic uh, resistance bacteria in wastewater. Um, there's also biomarkers of uh, disease, uh, uh, sorry, of, of diet and nutrition uh, to be able to sort of get um, a, a bird's eye view again of how are people uh, eating uh, at, at, at a population health level. Um, there's also other uh, infectious diseases uh, of, of interest. You know, there's polio virus is a very known uh, example where wastewater epidemiology has been very, very helpful in 2013. So Israel has been implementing um, wastewater epidemiology for polio virus monitoring for a long time now. And in 2013, they saw a detection in wastewater, quickly rolled out a vaccination campaign in, a, in the area, um, and they were able to avert uh, you know, a larger outbreak um, thanks to this sort of detection, but also very swift action that was taken um, based, based on the data. Um, another uh, interesting uh, biomarker is hepatitis C, similarly to SARS-CoV-2 that has you know, this asymptomatic uh, phase and you know, people are carriers but don't know uh, because of asymptomatic status, yet this is something that can be uh, seen um, in, in wastewater. And then there's pharmaceuticals uh, and, and drugs. Uh, as I said, Biobot started with uh, the opioids uh, and um, it's, you know, unfortunately this, this epidemic has not um, decreased in, if anything, it has, uh, it, it has intensified unfortunately and has really become a shadow epidemic to, to the current pandemic. And so this is something that we, um, we will. We have already started uh, piloting in many communities and should be uh, launching very soon, large scale uh, across across the country to really work uh, with public health departments and helping them with this new data set, looking at consumption um, of of opioids. Um, because right now, all the data is overdose death, right? But death is the tip of the iceberg. Or emergency room visits. Again, it's only. It only tells you when things are that bad, but there is everything else beneath that, you know, we can't, we don't know. And so this data set can help uh, understand better how to do what public health does best, prevent opioid uh, uh, related death, prevent visits to the emergency room. Um, and so that, that we think that wastewater uh, epidemiology really has a, a key role to play in sort of bringing a very new data set uh, to substance use uh, mitigation uh, programs. Next, please. Um, and yeah, those are sort of four key components in, in you know, uh, to control uh, for in, in high-risk substance uh, programs. So fentanyl, of course, meth, cocaine, um, and, and nicotine. Next, please. Um, and yeah, you know, Based on our experience on SARS-CoV-2 on uh, and opioids and, and high-risk substance more largely, and all the R&D that we have in the pipeline for other infectious agents and you know bacteria or, and other respiratory uh, viruses, the goal is really to make um, wastewater surveillance as a permanent uh, pillar of public health uh, infrastructure. Public health surveillance uh, has existed for a very long time, has very traditional methods of, of, of doing um, collecting data and investigating sources of disease and then addressing them with, you know, programs and, and initiatives. Um, but we really think that this, you know, creating a new public health data set uh, will be able to make public health more proactive um, and data driven. Um, so yeah, thank you. Thank you for your time today. And um, I'll, yeah, I'm happy to take any questions. Nora, thank you so much for that presentation. Uh, you gave us a wealth of information and it's really kind of hard to pack it into such a short period of time. Uh, unfortunately, that means that we're only gonna be able to get to a few of the questions. Uh, the first question from the chat comes from Michael Chung, who asks, what level of fidelity can you get between residential versus commercial zones, schools, et cetera? How much can you differentiate between residents and visitors? Yeah, uh, thank you, that, that's a good question. So to the point of fidelity, the limit of detection is actually quite good. We can detect one infected person in a, you know, 6,500 people uh, or less. So 
this is, we work, and I, I haven't mentioned this, but we work with building levels uh, customers. So think about congregate uh, living settings like nursing homes, for instance, or uh, rehabilitation centers. So um, they're also really care about this data to be able to use it um, uh, for, to implement other mitigation uh, strategies. Uh, and so, you know, be it at the municipal level, at the building level, or at the wastewater treatment level, all three levels of sampling uh, provide high, high fidelity now um, of, of results. Now to the question about visitors, that's, that's an interesting uh, question because the data you get is of everyone who has used the toilet in this setting, be it a building or a community, um, and you don't know if that person lives there or works there uh, or um, is just visiting for you know, the weekend because there is a Halloween party or Christmas or... So the short answer is that you can't know because the, the, it's completely anonymous, right? It's, it's an aggregate data set that, that you have. But by, and this is where the power of trends comes in. And that's why frequently testing, you're able to see, okay, was this an outlier? Uh, or does this really re represent the amount of community transmission and viral spread there is uh, in the community? So the next question uh, is by Vanessa Palmer. And Vanessa asked, do you have a sense of coverage both over time and space that is for how many mun municipalities in the US these data are available and going back how far? So, I can speak about what the work we do at, at BioBot. We've been working with communities since March 2020. So we are coming up to almost two years uh, very, uh, very soon. Um, last summer, I'd say we, we covered about all 50 states. About We were receiving data from over 320 wastewater treatment plants, so communities, and representing over 90 million uh, Americans. So, um, but you know, different, you know, other states have uh, also uh, wastewater epidemiology programs. Some university groups also have some, uh, some make the data public. And so, um, yeah, I, I think there's, there's, a, there's quite a few efforts going on around the country. Yeah, I mean, there's even data to show from other countries where they've actually detected SARS-CoV in their wastewater because they were testing for other pathogens, viruses, and bacterias um, in November of 2019. Um, the last question from the chat we'll be able to uh, get into, uh, forgive me if I mispronounce your name, is from Gautam Thaku. Uh, could you talk about the assay used for SARS-CoV-2 detection in wastewater? Is it target specific like PCR? What are some challenges when trying to detect viral RNA, which can easily degrade amidst all the background, quote unquote, junk you'd find in sewage? Yeah, um, that, that's a good question. And the good news is that SARS-CoV-2 viral RNA is quite stable. Um, and so no fear of, of, uh, of degradation uh, on, for that virus. Um, and yes, absolutely. We do a PCR test the same way um, it, when we receive the wastewater samples in the lab, we do a PCR test um, looking at you know, primers the same way that we do a PCR test on a nasal swab. All right. Well, I think that that's gonna be all the time that we have for questions. Um, Nora, I just wanna thank you so much for providing us a look into this topic. Obviously, it's extremely relevant right now, and we believe it will continue to be so moving forward. On behalf of the Office of Alumni Affairs at the Harvard Chan School, we'd like to thank you for taking your time to be with us. Uh, we will be sharing a survey link now in the Q&A box uh, and in a follow-up email for you to provide feedback about today's session and to help us plan for future programming. The Office of Alumni Affairs is continuously looking for alumni stories to showcase and so please share yours in the survey to help plan and shape future programming. Definitely this type of session will have to make uh, an hour instead of a half an hour. Um, I'd also like to put in a shameless plug uh, for WEF. Uh, obviously we believe that this is an extremely important topic as well, so much so that we're planning the first 
Public Health and Water Conference and Wastewater Disease Surveillance Summit, which is next month uh, in Cincinnati, Ohio. So uh, if you have the time and the interest, uh, you can uh, register and join us. Thank you all for your attention and have a great rest of your day.